what am I trying to talk about today? I want to talk about living in a society and not an economy because I'm actually very tired of the fact that we act, make an assumption or the government tends to make an assumption that all that counts is the economy that we live in and not the society. In 1995, I started talking about a more civil society and I want to talk about how we get to being a more civil society. This is the big picture stuff. This is, I hope, a view that will allow everything else that you've heard today and other things that you've heard to come together so that you actually have a sense that we're going to get all the sorts of reforms and ideas and things happening if we've got the sort of society that will accept change, that is interested in, in being more responsible, that's interested in more collective views, that trusts each other, that is more civil in the sense of valuing what comes between us, what's the relationship between us. The problem I think that we've had for the last 30-odd years is we've had this sort of economic model. And economics is a very bad social science in some ways because it's based on the idea that human on human behaviour, like most of the rest of the social scientists, they forget to tell you that when they do the equations. But it's actually based on the assumption that there's this gentleman, and I use the term advisedly, called economically rational man, who is a self-interested individual who acts rationally uh, to make decisions for his own interests. Now, there's a lot of problems with that, apart from the gender one, and we'll worry about that one later, that it's the idea that, A, that we're self-interested individuals, that human beings are ba basically self-interested, which actually comes from a rather old-fashioned view about uh, evolution, which talks about survival of the fittest, which has the idea that what we've got is to compete with everybody else, and if we compete, the ones that compete best come out on top. Now, what's really interesting is if you look at some of the sociobiology that's happening at the moment, they're actually beginning to revise that view of evolution, and there's a whole lot of new books and new ideas coming out pointing out that the reason that humanity survives was that we learned to cooperate, that we learned language, we learned to think, we learned conceptual skills, and basically that we were social beings. Now, social beings are not individually and self-interested because we actually understand that what counts for us is our relationship with friends, our relationships with, with others, that we are not here just to sort of collect goods and stuff for ourselves. So if you look, think about that, that whole idea of the equation that's built on self-interested, rational individualism doesn't actually work. And I think that's what we've seen recently with the global financial crisis. We've seen super, you know, the entire stock market going absolutely bananas to the point where nobody knows why it's going up and why it's going down and how to solve the particular problems. And the trouble with being as old as I am is I actually remember before economics came in, that was in the 1960s and 70s, and we had an emphasis on the big society, the good society, the better society. And then the word society sort of disappeared entirely off the agenda and the word society actually goes back to the idea of socius. It's a Latin word about the connections between us. And the connections between us is really what counts. You think about it. It's your relationships. It's your friendships. It's your sense of belonging. It's your sense of being part of it. It's your emotional stuff. It's your feelings about others and the, your perception of how they feel about you. That's what makes life worthwhile. That's what makes us get up in the morning. That's what gives us pleasure. Somehow or other, we've forgotten about all of those things that connect us together, that connect us together with friends, with relatives, with workmates, with everybody, with the neighbours, with people that we meet on the street. We've got all sorts of connections, and some of them I sort of see like a little thin bottom of thread, and some of them are really tight ropes and things that tie us together. And these are the bits that I, re I decided was really that term social capital applied to. And I talked about this in 1995 in the Boyer Lectures because... I was trying to get across the idea that what makes society good is the connections between us, not the things that we own individually. So financial capital is about money that some people own, not all of us, unfortunately. You know, physical capital is about land and things like that, which mostly, again, is owned individually, and certainly we need to think about how you own that more collectively, and Aboriginal people could teach us a lot about that. And even human capital, which is very fashionable at the moment, is what we know individually. So social capital is the one thing which builds on the idea that it's the trust between human beings that really counts. It's the relationship between us. It's the quality of those relationships that count. It's the, you know, it's the good tensions between us. It's the resilience of the relationships between us. 
And this is based on ideas like high levels of trust and trustworthiness. When I did the Boyer lectures, I talked a lot about trust and I was worried because you can have good trust and bad trust. Good trust is when you've got a generalised feeling of goodwill and you believe most people are going to do the right thing. Bad trust is when you only trust the people you know and the people like you so that you try and exclude those people who are not like you. Now, unfortunately, I think we've got a society at the moment which is often built on bad trust, which is built on creating outsiders, it's built on creating scapegoats. Now, some people might say, OK, relationships, all of that stuff, that's private stuff. That's stuff we should deal with as individuals. That's stuff that we need to deal with in our own heads and educate our children so that they're good and have good manners or whatever it is. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. In the intro to me, there was a bit of a, a background thing which says, yes, I was an escapee from Nazism as a very small child. My parents had to leave Austria because we were Jewish. I think the lesson that Nazism taught us was that entire nations can go wrong. They can do the wrong thing, not because they're evil people, but because what Hannah Arendt, who's one of my favourite authors, called the banality of evil, that good people can do evil deeds if all of those around them do evil things as well. That makes me, I'm a sociologist, so that makes me wonder about how do we create the good society that encourages us to be generous, to be fair, to do the right thing about others. And if you do that, then people are more likely to do it. Not everybody, some people will always transgress, but most of us, if you look at the ideas of human society, most of us are cooperative, most of us are not self-interested, and most of us are certainly not rational. If you think about the decisions you make about money and various other things, I'm sure most of you can find many occasions where we make totally irrational decisions and then justify them afterwards. So it's actually really important to start thinking about what makes us make the right decisions for the society at large, what makes us think communally, what makes us think collectively, what makes us take responsibility for others as well as assert our own rights. And that's where we keep falling down because the sorts of social policies that are at the moment around don't encourage that. You've only got to look at some of the sorts of questions that have been arisen the mo that are arising at the moment. If you have a look at some of the issues around boat people, they're a very small number of people, and most of them are actually perfectly ordinary good people who can't live in the countries they live in. Yet we've had government and opposition creating a level of sort of fear and anxiety that means that it's become a huge issue. There's so few of those boat people. There are far more people that overstay their visas that come in here on tourist visas. Why do we have a panic? Why do we have a major issue about it? Because politicians are using outgroups to create scapegoats, to create sense of fear. So they mutter on about border protection. I mean, we hardly need border protection against a few kitty boats, some of which that sink along the way. So we've got a really skewed version of what social policy is about. We're not very nice to the unemployed. I mean, we had a tax summit last week in Canberra and all sorts of really conservative and what might be called sort of right-wing groups agreed with the welfare lobby and other groups, groups like the unemployed, people in unemployment benefits, really didn't have enough money to get through a week to survive on and suggested that the actual rate be raised. Do you think the government took it up? No. Do you think the opposition will take it up? No. Why not? Because we, the unemployed and sole parents and group like that are used as scapegoats. They're punished in order to make people feel good about the fact that they're productive citizens. But I don't think we can call ourselves a good society if we don't take care of the people that get, have the least capacity to make take care of themselves. So what I want to do basically is start talking about how do we actually go to service to capital? I mean, first of all, what does make us behave badly? I think we behave badly when we live in a society that we see as unfair, particularly on both levels. Inequality is often seen as unfair. And the thing that's interesting about that is it makes the people at the top that benefit from the inequality feel anxious because they feel that they haven't got it there legitimately and other people might be out to get them. And it makes people at the bottom feel angry because they feel that they're excluded unfairly from the resources that other people have. So there's a lot of evidence that the more unequal a society is, the more tensions and things that there are around it. So a lack of a sense of agency, which goes with that, because if the world is unfair... If you're at the bottom of the heap, you feel there's not much point in doing anything to save yourself or change things because you don't think that anybody's going to pay any attention to you. You think whatever you do, you're going to fail because the world is against you. And that sense of lack of sense of agency, lack of sense of control, it's been found by the World Health Organization to be really important, which means we need a society where people feel 
that they are respected, that there is some sense of agency, that they are allowed to do things, that, there is, that they're heard. It doesn't mean they always have to win, but it does mean that we have to hear out groups, we have to hear minority groups and not just let the majority who can afford to buy various uh, types of services from public relations firms to get their voices heard. Fear and anxiety. Fear and anxiety are very toxic. I've already mentioned the way that we use poor bloody boat people to create fear and anxiety in the community, but there's a lot of other stuff around carbon tax and other things where huge levels of anxiety are being brought up for no particular reason. And people are anxious about the future. They're anxious about what's going to happen with the environment. They're anxious about what's happening about various things. And anxiety doesn't make us generous. It doesn't make us relaxed. It doesn't make us trust other people. It increases distrust. Social and cultural exclusion, well, I've sort of mentioned those in passing because, but I just want to emphasise that if you've got groups of people in the society who feel that they are outsiders, they are going to find it much harder to feel as though they're part of the society to contribute towards the society and do the right thing by the, by the other people in society. So if we're going to create a more civil society, we really need to work out what matters to us and how we value those parts of our lives that we do as paid workers in public offices and, and also but also and this is where my feminist stuff comes out we've got to recognize that the things we do unpaid in the household in the community in the society generally the things we don't that not life doesn't isn't all about paid work it's about our relationships outside paid work whether it's our creativity or whether it's our care for others or whether it's caring for ourselves and and being part of a community in a society it gives us a good feeling and yet we don't in, actually encourage that so we actually need to understand it's our social and emotional ties that make us behave well if they are right. And it's our social and emotional ties that can make us do bad things. But we don't actually have a government that's encouraging that. So I want to make sure that we reinvent the big society, the good society, and make sure that we actually start thinking about the sorts of society that we want to live in and the, how we actually get on with cooperation and collaboration. So here's some other basic questions that I wrote out that we need to develop. We need to shift the balance so that they stop talking about the bloody economy every time they open their mouth. This is politicians from both sides. And put social policy as a much higher priority, creating the good society that we actually put up a filter which says, is this going to increase inequality? Is it going to increase unfairness? Is it going to make people feel bad? If it is, let's sit down and seriously consider whether the costs of the social lo losses is going to outweigh the actual gains. We need to actually rethink the, the public provision of services. At one stage, we had lots of things that were in the public sphere. Then... Since the 1980s, people have undermined the fact that government's good at doing things. Government is good at doing something. Some things we shouldn't leave to the markets. There's aspects of health and education and welfare and creativity and other things which are not about what we buy. They're about what we feel and about our relationships, and it shouldn't be only available to those who can afford it. I think we need to think through what stuff we need in the public sphere and what things we should buy in the market. We've never really had that debate, and it's more than time that we had it because the market doesn't work for many things. Market failures are very common. Housing is a very good example in some of these areas. Let's actually talk about how we determine wages and how we determine those things. And, but also, let's start talking about how we create a more collective view of what's fair and what's not fair. And that means we've got to have fair taxes and payments and, you know, the risk of sort of introducing things there. I mean, why do we actually give huge tax concessions to the rich and whinge about the payments we make to the poor? The rich take far more out of the tax system than the poor do, but we never hear about that because they run the system. We need to change gendered assumptions about what's valued and what's not valued. Women earn 17% less than men, not because they work less, that's per hour, but because things like taking care of kids and taking care of old people and taking care of people generally is valued less than taking care of money. I mean, why should somebody who parks a car be paid more than somebody who cares for kids? Why should as the chief financial officer always get more than the chief human resources person? The chief human resources person is usually female. The chief financial officer is usually male. I can assure you taking care of money is a lot easier than taking care of people. And we just need to do some of those switches. We need to short... Thank you. We need to change... We need 
need to be sure that we can increase social well-being. So we've got time for other things. But I've also known, and just think about it, people who walk, work shorter hours tend to work much harder than people who work longer hours. So why do we assume longer hours means more productivity? I think it's time that we started questioning some of those really basic things uh, that we've got. We need to use technology to change the way that we actually go to work. And I think we actually need to say that, why do we always have to be physically in the workforce? These days they contact you all over the place. Then we could use our time much more effectively. So I just think these are some of the ideas that I think we could put on the agenda to create a much better social system, to actually create a situation where we can enjoy the pleasures of each other's company, enjoy the relationships that we have, learn to trust people again, have a government that does the right thing by us and doesn't try and sort of beat each other up all the time. We've got lots of things to do and I think that we need to start doing them pretty well shortly. I think I'm about to run out of time. Am I about to run out of time? That's a bit, I can't tell on these things. I'll keep going until somebody cuts me off. You can't hear me. So this is just basically a plea to put the good society, the more civil society, the more creative, more trusting, more trustworthy society on the agenda and dump economics back to where it ought to be, which is just working out how we pay for the things that we value rather than how we only value those things we pay for. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you can hear that applause, Eva, <laughs> whether it's coming through my microphone. Everyone's... We really wish you could see the audience. Thank you. We're so grateful for you taking the time to spend it with us in Brisbane via Skype. It's very special. We're going to sign out now and uh, keep going with the program. But thanks again, Eva. It's been a pleasure. And if people want to contact me, please do. And let's work out how we make the revolutionary change. <laughs> <laughs>